that on archive for everyone. Uh, but open up to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. So 1 Peter chapter 3, I'll make sure I'm actually talking in the mic here. 1 Peter 3, and our text is verses 1 through 7. And again, like I said, this tailors very much to two people <laughs> here right now, and hopefully for those listening more, but uh, and us in the future. And the text reads, <laughs> well, you got a verse there for uh, for your husband there too, but the verse uh, the verses read here: Wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel; rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, bless you, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid of any terror, or afraid with any terror. Husbands likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. With that, let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I think that it's living and active and it speaks to us today. God, just prepare our hearts. Help us in whatever stage of life we're in to take this text and to, uh, to honor you with it. Help us in all things seek to, uh, to be a good example and live our lives in good standing before, uh, before you especially. Help us be blameless in our walk and righteous and holy as we live these lives in, in front of a, an audience that really mostly does not know you. We just pray that we can be examples to those around us and be evangelistic witnesses of your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so this is couched within a section of Peter saying you need to live your lives well in order to be a good example for others who don't know the Lord. And at this time, yet again, Peter was writing this in the reign of Nero, and during the reign of Nero, does anyone know what was going on at that time? Some review from the previous weeks. So Nero, he was, he was uh, the ruler of, he was emperor of Rome, and he, uh, he was known for his persecution of Christians, especially. Uh, if you've ever heard of the software Nero Burning Rom, that's based off of Nero Burning Rome. He would burn things and then blame it on Christians. And he ended up burning up quite a lot of uh, literature and works uh, of the time because of his, his carelessness. Uh, he would also light Christians on fire and call them candles and, uh, and use those as, uh, as entertainment for himself. So he was a, re a really sick ruler, but he hated Christians. Uh, and at the time, Christians were being persecuted for simply believing in Jesus. Um, a lot of times around the world, we still see that people are still persecuted for Christ's sake. But, yeah, Jesus warned us we would be hated just as he was. Um, so we need to remain strong. But, okay, here we have this text. So it's couched within that. Christians are being persecuted. And in this case, some wives were won without the husbands being won over as well. So the, the women would find Jesus, and then the husbands were still left in the dark for a while. But what Peter here is saying is, is let, uh, just let it go, it's fine. Um, just uh, live your lives so that even if you're persecuted, you're a good example to your husbands. And so maybe in due time, they'll come over and, and find Jesus as well. And so um, here we have, uh, starting in... Uh, just a comparison. Paul, Paul gives advice to husbands and wives in Ephesians 2, I mean Ephesians 5, 22 through, 20, uh, through 33. Let me just wait until that goes off. <laughs> it's distracting. Are they going to call again? I don't know. Okay, cool. So let's try that again. All right, so comparison here. Paul's advice to husbands and wives, Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. And Paul's main idea there is, is man is the head of the wife. It's a picture of Christ as the head of the church, his bride. It's not a means of uh, status, but it is a means of role, and it's meant to be a picture of the grace that God has. And so men are supposed to show sacrificial love, even to the point of giving their lives for the wives. And so that's a sacrificial statement of love, and, and the women are supposed to respect their husbands 
and respectful submission there. So um, it's an offensive idea today, and you'll, you'll hear a lot of ministers kind of couch around it as well, but <laughs> but it needs to be done in order to present a good picture of, of Christ as head of the church and uh, just parallel their husbands as a head of their wives. Um, Peter's main idea here, the comparison there, the woman needs to honor and respect her husband, him being responsible over both. And Peter touches much more on conduct here, and he's dealing with how to behave. Uh, so men, treat her well and gently. That's his main idea. And he covers that very briefly. And... Um, it's interesting there how he treats it. He's just like kind of to the point with, with the men in verse 7 to, to husbands. And uh, he gives a good illustration, kind of a, a more gentle, convincing type of thing. And that's kind of in his character, too. He's you known as kind of big old macho man, this fisherman. And he, would, he was that guy who, who jumped out on the boat and uh, jumped out of the boat and, uh, and walked toward Jesus. And everyone else was in the boat, but Peter was jumping out. And so he was a gutsy guy uh, known as Peter. His real name was Simon. It wasn't even his real name, but... Uh, how Jesus saw him as as a, a strong uh, foundational type uh, type man, him being the chief foundation, and then the other apostles being on top of that. But uh, but Peter was very very much uh, a leader uh, in the early church. So, um, but women they're supposed to be uh, submissive with a gentle conduct and a pure heart. And so you see Paul and Peter saying pretty much the same type of idea. Uh, Peter's much more couched in a behavioral tone. Um, so he's concerned that Christians are going to hold the name of Jesus high in the midst of uh, how they're going to be treated, which in, in persecution. Heart relates to lifestyle, uh, and that's uh, relating to how we live. Verses 1 through 4, there's a big even if here. There are a bunch of even ifs and even if ideas in, in Peter. Two direct clauses in, uh, in the middle of this book. In verses 3, 1, you see, even if your husband does not obey the word. And so that's... Uh, Essentially, it's in our court, so it's in our court to behave well. And then verse 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake and being just a believer, in our conduct, we have uh, the even-if statements. It's the same idea throughout. Live your life in a pure manner. Our focus needs to be on God. We need to seek to please him in all things and give no excuse for uh, ill repute. And so when others are looking at our lives, they can, they can see there's something different about it. You heard that quote by St. Francis of Assisi, which really wasn't necessarily a quote from him. It's really an anonymous source where he says, uh, says, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. It's got some merit, but uh, what, what the good part about what he's saying is you need to live your lives in a pure manner so that you're shining the radiance of Jesus. But ultimately, we do need to also tell those the specifics about the gospel, because otherwise they'll not know the specifics, what we need to believe about Jesus. All right, so key idea here, uh, the importance of a good testimony. Again, shining Jesus' glory through a clean testimony shouldn't be a matter of legalism, but instead of love for Jesus. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments in John 14. So it's not a means of our own self-righteousness, but when we are right before God, we can rejoice in his preservation of us and the witness that we're having in others' lives and see fruit from that. Uh, it can also be a stumbling block to have uh, a bad testimony. For example, you can think of all these televangelists who have just really bad testimonies or they're caught in some sin or... Uh, some, some, just something absolutely treacherous, and it's in a big public setting. What people say in, in the world is, what, what does Jesus have to do with anything if these people are corrupt? And a part of it is that we're not going to be perfect, but another part is a lot of these people don't watch uh, their own pride and their own sinfulness, and um, they don't take those thoughts captive. And so it's something where people in ministry and Christians uh, all together, they, they need to, because all Christians are ministers, uh, they do need to take their uh, their walk with the Lord seriously and um, and shun sin and to hate sin. Our errors will take place, but yeah, we need others to see that we're striving to be more like Christ and not just gross <laughs> and sinful and delighting in, in what we're doing wrong. So basic points from Peter t uh, to wives and getting back to the, the passage here. First, wives, be submissive, uh, and that's by your conduct you're able to win them over. That's been the whole argument of Peter in this conduct section. It's a matter of living lives that are pleasing to God. So, remember Jesus did say, and then regarding the even if statements here, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In the case of wives without a believing husband, and this is very much a good application here, in that Jesus said, if your husbands mistreat you or look down on you for being a Christian, it's not something where you should be shaken and be pulled down, but 
It's something where Jesus said, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so if someone makes fun of you or says, you know, you're, you're brain dead for believing in Jesus, you believe in a fairy tale, this is ridiculous what you believe, how can you believe this, or how can you believe that Jesus is the only way? I hear a lot of that. But what we need to do is, is trust in Jesus. Jesus said himself, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. But we need to keep our conduct right also. Think of Stephen in Acts. I was thinking of these examples of, of pure testimonies. We see Stephen full of the Holy Spirit. He was one of the deacons appointed in Acts 6. And then later on in chapter 6, we see the unfortunate event of him being stoned. Well, 6 and 7 is given an account of how... Um, and I'm not talking about being stoned like, you know, he's high on drugs. He's being stoned like killed for his faith. Well, he, uh, he had a clean testimony. So he was explaining Jesus as the Messiah all throughout the Hebrew Bible and how the people were guilty of crucifying him. And so people, instead of being convicted, earlier on in Acts, we see a lot of people were, were convicted. And again, some people were hardened of heart. They, they heard, you were, because of you, you, you released a murderer instead of Jesus. You released Barabbas instead of Jesus. And what, uh, what he was saying there was, you're guilty and we need to be forgiven. We need to seek, uh, seek his forgiveness. Um, so we have Stephen here explaining that and the, the people listening, they don't like it. They ended up stoning him. Uh, do you know who's, uh, they laid down their garments to stone him at the feet of someone. Who was that? It was Saul. And he became... He became Paul, yep. And so we have Saul there, too, being influenced by this, too, and, and God was sovereign over the situation. Um, but you think of Stephen's example, how uh, it says in Acts 6.15, and all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him saw his face as the face of an angel. And the purity of Stephen just shining through as God gave him the message to speak. And he wasn't saying something that was totally offensive or of his own will. He wasn't saying that you know, Mickey Mouse was of the devil. <laughs> he wasn't saying that you know, anything of his own opinion. It was, he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was sticking to the basics and everything else was left to, you know, to them to, to respond. The gospel always calls for a response. If people are mad at you, make sure it's not because you're doing evil. And that's Peter's main idea there. So Stephen, just being a, a great example, we see Saul, which means precious or, or chosen or like central. And he became Paul, which is little or small. And so we see that he, uh, when he was persecuting Christians, he thought that he was the greatest. He had this huge resume. We see in Philippians 3, he could brag about anything. But, uh, but he chose uh, to believe in Christ. And he was kind of <laughs> forced into that miraculously. Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus. And uh, God worked even through that. Uh, and he became humble. And he says later on in, in 1 Timothy that he's the chief of all sinners. And so going from, I'm the most righteous, I'm going to persecute everyone, to I'm the chief of sinners, and him realizing how great God is and how little we are. And that's a truth we need to take as well. So how else should Christian wives live, especially with a non-Christian husband? Just going through the attributes here. Chaste, uh, literally uh, agnos, which uh, it means pure or sacred uh, or holy, just living a, a pure life. Uh, with fear, with reverence or honor, we have a, a delineation there between fear and like being terrified of in an abusive situation. It's, we're never called to, to be uh, submissive in that. Uh, if, if there's an abusive uh, relationship, that needs to be you know, squelched and taken care of. So uh, husbands are never called to abuse their wives. Um, so wives are two. Again, here, revere, respect, honor uh, their husbands. And then inward. It's not something where uh, you know, wives are to be kind of this gaudy, um, uh, annoying, obnoxious uh, spirit. It's, it's, uh, it's a matter of they need to uh, have an inward faith in Jesus that, uh, that just shines through. And, and gentle and quiet, humble. So um, not someone who, who goes out and brags about you know, how awesome they are. Not like a, a Saul type of wife. That would be kind of weird. All right, so uh, the hidden person of the heart, that's kind of the, the weird term in here, hidden person of the heart. That just means the innermost depth of your being, and so that which is secret but what God values, and it's called incorruptible here. So God values the, uh, the most 
innermost part of us. And so uh, whatever we display, if that's different from what's deep inside of us, that's, uh, that's what we need to watch. We don't need to be image managers. We need to be authentic and, uh, and sold out for Jesus. We need, we need to strive to be meek. Again, not prideful. So gentle, kind, and sweet. Now, Paul, uh, Peter gives an appeal here. Not, not Paul here. Peter gives an appeal to the wives, saying the patriarchs respected their husbands. Or what am I saying? The wives of the patriarchs respected their husbands. There we go. I was going to say matriarchs, but that would have been a little bit awkward. Um, but the wives of the patriarchs. So, for example, Sarah here. Uh, Peter's essential argument. Women, you should model ourselves. Yourselves. Oh, my goodness. There, this pen doesn't even work. Cool. You should model yourselves after women of faith. <laughs> there, let's try that again. So Peter, Peter was saying, women, you need to... Yeah, thank you. <laughs> cool. You can... You dump that one. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, okay. So Peter is saying, women, follow this example of this godly woman who, who uh, by faith, you're her daughters. And so just as we're children of Abraham by faith, and women are essentially... Uh, children of, of Sarah, who also was a faithful woman in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. Pretty cool. Uh, you can't say that. You know, everyone can't say that. Like, hey, I'm in Hebrews 11, <laughs> an example of faith. Um, we do need to live as though uh, we were shooting for that. Uh, Sarah, she was submissive. She called Abram uh, Lord or Master, and so honoring, uh, honoring him, not replacing the Lord for her husband, uh, but showing him due honor. And so later on in, in 1 Peter or what am I saying? Before in First Peter, there we go. My brain is on now. Okay, First Peter two seventeen is is the verse where it says, "Show proper respect to everyone." And just a summary verse. That's I think one of the upward verses this year too. It was uh, for summer camp, but um, yeah. So we need to uh, honor and respect those uh, in those positions. So just as Sarah, wives are to let your conduct, uh, let uh, wives are to let their conduct be pure. Uh, they need to be respectful to their husbands and serve an example to them, especially if they're believers and then they are not. So as Paul said also that uh, wives who didn't know the Lord and come to know the Lord and their husbands are still behind them on that, uh, it's, they're not to, to leave them. And so it's, it's a matter of be faithful to them and, and be an example to them. But also be firm in what you believe and do not sway even in the face of persecution. We have this, uh, this phrase here, don't be terrified or afraid with horror. Wives are to fear their husband in reverence, but not be fearful of them with terror. And that's the, the like, I'm scared of you type of fear. That's, uh, that's not what Peter is saying. So, again, we need to, to remain resolute regardless of what persecution we get. Uh, we need to stand firm. And so that goes for, for wives as well. Uh, husbands, verse 7. And uh, finally, we get to them because this passage is mostly toward uh, just the organization of wives. But you know, kind of a, a straight shooting topic right here, kind of like a Mark Driscoll type of comment. It's just to the point and very, very, uh, this, this one's the scary part because we see here that uh, husbands, and speaking to the, the believing husbands, husbands are to be under understanding and to give honor to their wives uh, as the weaker vessel. And so talking about just in terms of uh, they're more fair, they're more gentle, they're less powerful in strength, but she may be weaker physically, but she is equal in sharing in the inheritance of eternal life. And so treat her well is, is his main message. So application, men be gentle to, to them and take care of them. Otherwise, the drawback here, and this is what, what uh, Chad's dad picked up on at his wedding too, and it's huge, and it's, it's, it's frightening if we, if we don't take this seriously, uh, or else your prayers will be hindered. And so it's a matter of when we're married and when we're... Uh, just in any real relationship, we need to, to be right in our conduct before God. And here in a marriage relationship, you just need to, uh, as husbands, be gentle and, and love your wives and, uh, and treat them kindly and take care of them. Otherwise, your prayers will be hindered. And so essentially, happy wife, happy life. Otherwise, it's treacherous <laughs> because it's uh, bad to be on any unfavorable side of God. Problems that men encounter quite often and sometimes it goes with personality, so sometimes it's a, it's a quirk, but some, sometimes it's just something deep-seated that, that needs to be adjusted, and that's first passivity. Passivity, just as Adam stood by Eve and let her take the fruit, uh, the language there in, in Genesis 3 when they fall into sin, it wasn't just Eve there taking the fruit and Adam was just off on his own not knowing what she was doing. The phraseology is he was right there beside her, and so he should have told her no and, uh, and said, you know, this is 
this isn't what we do. <laughs> but uh, And he took part too. Um, but he let her take from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We still have problems with passivity. And so we are not to dominate our wives oppressively, but on the other end, we're not to just sit back and uh, let anyone go astray in the family. And so men are supposed to take charge in the family. They're supposed to take bold steps of faith, and that should be encouraged by the wife, wives. Um, aggressiveness is the other one. Men can get frustrated and overstep their bounds and get angry and uh, end up in abuse. And so that's, uh, that's what needs to stop. So if it's continual anger and frustrations, it needs to be worked out. We can be angry. Ephesians says, be angry and sin not, as well as um, don't let the sun set on your anger. It's something where we need to uh, be resolute and involved in being constructive about how we're angry. Um, so, uh, so something to understand in that uh, men will never make completely perfect decisions, but they can see God's direction and be led by his voice. And uh, with that, women need to respect this in a marriage and encourage their husbands in living such a life of dependence on God. That's not saying that men need to make all decisions. They can look to their wives to do many things, and uh, there could be a shared balance of, of roles and duties and that type of thing. Uh, but men need to lead the family, and wives need to respect their husbands. Essentially, the picture there, the unequally yoked, two oxen in a yoke in farming. They, they pull either one direction. If they're equally yoked, they're going to do a lot of good work. They're going to till the ground, and oxen are strong, so they're going to get a lot of good things done. But if there's... Uh, the whole matter of being unequally yoked. So, for example, Christian dating a non-Christian, not a good idea because they're pulling in different directions. And so if you have two oxen in a relationship trying to focus on one thing and they're focusing in totally different directions, you're going to go nowhere. And most likely you're going to be pulled away from what the Lord does. And so that's really the only thing that Paul mandates is that believer, seek out believer to marry and an unbeliever. Uh, he doesn't really address that. So that's that's Unbeliever is supposed to seek out an unbeliever, but um, just something where you need to be unified in vision. So uh, just in, uh, in application of that, just uh, in all relationships, just seek to honor God. That's what we need to, to do, and we need all, in all things to seek his honor. Uh, so regardless of whether we're married or not, uh, whether we will probably be married, stat, the stat is what, like 98% of people get married. I mean, it's most likely that we will. Uh, at some point, at some time, whether soon, whether tomorrow, whether I'm not saying I'm getting married tomorrow, but whatever, whenever we do, <laughs> yeah, I scared you, didn't I? But uh, wh whenever we do, it's just something where we need to seek to honor God. Not not something we need to fear, but we need to just be resolved in our hearts that we're going to honor God and what we do and how we behave. So uh, that in itself is a is a picture to a non-believing world that we are truly believing in what we put forth, that we are Christians, that we do respect and obey Jesus, we love him, and, uh, and that in loving our wives too, that's a, a sacrificial way of presenting Jesus and the church. So again, it's a it's whole evangelistic thing, the whole uh, gospel is evangelistic, it's for people who, again, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, those who need to hear. So uh, keep that in mind this week, and uh, yeah, just pray through that. And uh, as we either are married or prepare to be married or are waiting <laughs> to be prepared for marriage, it's just something where we need to uh, seek to honor God. So with that, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much again for just uh, the institution of your relationships that you've given us, uh, the husband and the wife, uh, for the man and the woman. We just pr uh, praise you for that relationship that uh, just such intimacy and, and, and love and, and respect that's, that goes around in that. Just pray that, Lord, as you bring that into our lives and if uh, whatever relationships you bring into our lives, just help us be honoring to you, whether it's uh, child to parent, whether it's uh, boyfriend to girlfriend, whether it's husband to wife. God, we just pray that we'll be honoring to you. Uh, guide us, lead us, speak to us, help us hear your voice. Lord, help us not squelch the Holy Spirit and his leading in our lives and just pray for a great week of spreading forth your word. Help us be lights in the midst of darkness, shining forth your glory. Help us not be hidden underneath a bushel basket. But help us, again, be like that city on top of a hill. Just uh, praise you, God, in Jesus' name. Help us have a great week. Amen.